Hi, I'm Steve Kep, a co-founder of From Day One, our forum on corporate values, and we're looking forward to hosting today's webinar. But before I do, I want to share something special we have for attendees of today's webinar. Our next monthly virtual conference happens to be tomorrow, April 21st, and it's about digital tools for building an engaged, productive team. This is our most hands-on and practical conference of the year. If you're an HR professional and you've been trying to get your head around the digital tools and options available for collaboration, employee engagement, diversity, inclusion metrics, avoiding bias in recruiting, and many other topics, this is the one for you. And thanks to our partners and today's sponsor, we have some complimentary VIP tickets available for those who have joined today's webinar. That's you. I'm putting the link in the chat function space right now. You want to take advantage of this one. The regular price for our conference tickets is $149, and this link will give you a free VIP ticket for the whole day's activities. And now on to today's webinar. Today we'll be exploring a topic that focuses on the ways in which employers can drive healthcare engagement and support their employees. The title for today's session is Fostering Employee Engagement in Healthcare with Technology. In the pandemic era, workforce health and well-being snapped into focus as a top priority for business leaders. With employees often puzzled by a wide array of choices, unaware of available benefits or reluctant to seek help, driving health engagement has become mission critical. We'll dive deep into how leading employers can address these issues with a seamless experience and ecosystem, a consumerized approach, and a balance of technology and compassion, as well as personalization and data-driven insights. Our sponsor today is League. I'll tell you a bit about them. League is the country's leading health operating system, a data-driven platform designed to provide a personalized single access hub for employees to find, understand, and use their health, well-being, and benefits programs. This panel discussion is particularly meaningful because League is an organization that's dedicated to transforming the way that employees engage with their help. 70% of League's users engage with their platform every month and customers like Unilever, Uber, Shopify, and Lush Cosmetics are among the hundreds of employers currently using League to drive healthcare engagement with employees. Now a few quick logistical items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand soon after the event, so you can look out for an email in about 24 hours with the link. That email will also have info on how you can get professional development credits for this session from the Society of Human Resource Management and look out for a written account of the conversation soon on our website at fromday1.co. In an hour at 3 p.m. Eastern time, we'll have a Q&A session. You can submit your questions anytime using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Lydia Dishman, a contributing editor for Fast Company, who writes and edits on such topics as tech and leadership, working parents, and other related issues. She's written for CBS Money Watch, Fortune, Popular Science, and the New York Times, among others. Okay, Lydia, over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you, audience, for spending the next 90 minutes with us. We hope that you are going to get some valuable insights that you can take into your own work at your own organizations. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything new by saying that healthcare benefits are an important part of overall compensation, yet employees do not often fully understand what they're getting. This is not news. A 2017 survey by The Guardian found that just about half of employees polled were able to accurately say which benefits they've, they selected. Uh, and this was long before COVID, as you know, upended workplaces across the globe. But the pandemic was responsible for workers' renewed focus on health insurance, supplemental health coverage, and other benefits. Yet even with all that emphasis, a recent consumer survey revealed that employees still don't get what they signed up for. And that's particularly true among younger workers where more than half didn't understand the benefits that they'd picked in open enrollment. So to discuss best practices to get workers to better engage with the offerings, we've gathered this wonderful panel of experts to offer their insights. So I'm gonna ask them to go around the virtual room here and um, introduce themselves. Uh, Eric, why don't we start with you? Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your work and your own experience over the past year to maintain your own health and well-being. Thank you, Lydia. So my name is Eric Parminer, and I'm the Vice President of Health Solutions at League. And uh, I lead a team of people who develop health strategies uh, with our 
clients and with their advisors, uh, really to drive engagement in health programs that make a difference, whether those are mental health programs or help with musculoskeletal issues, diabetes, or any number of, of conditions, goals, and um, interest. And uh, my experience over the past year is that this has been a transformational year, uh, probably for all of us who touch benefits, whether we're a member of a benefit plan and need to access resources more remotely, whether we're a benefit advisor, someone who manages benefits, uh, or someone who just manages the business overall, uh, this has been a very uh, challenging year for many, but a transformational year as well. Don't, don't go yet. You didn't tell us about how you were maintaining your own health and well-being. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, I use my Apple Watch and track my fitness and I get out every day and take a walk. And uh, so far, my 10,000 streak uh, steps per day is intact for the last uh, week and a half. That's excellent. And thank you for sharing that. I think it's important um, that we can all share these things with each other so we feel a little less alone in this very uh, challenging time. Um, Kimberly, we'll go to you next. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Kimberly Young. I'm the Vice President of Global Benefits at PAE, um, specializing in defense contracting. And I would say, you know, it's been a challenging year, but what I've done virtually for our employees at PAE and for myself is we've done virtual wellness challenges, uh, walking challenges, uh, nutritional challenges, water challenges, just to keep the team engaged as well as keep the employees engaged virtually in this unique uh, situation we found ourselves in uh, working remotely and not connecting for more than a year and so it's been it's been successful and challenging and uh, we've used some telehealth services as well. You know I'm glad you mentioned the water thing because we often talk about the you know the lack of the water cooler not going into the office anymore and it's more in the realm of talking about like you know where you used to go and and talk to your colleagues that you didn't sit next to but no one's talking about hydrating. <laughs> So, and it's hard to remember when you don't have that sitting right, right there in your office. Um, Matthew, why don't you go next? Good afternoon. My name is Matt Kay. Uh, I'm a managing director at Deloitte Consulting. Um, I work with, uh, so my clients are large uh, health insurance companies and large healthcare provider systems. And I develop or help my clients develop digital strategies and patient and consumer engagement mechanisms to help consumers uh, better manage their health and navigate uh, their, their, their benefits and health journeys. And uh, for me personally, Lydia, uh, I've tried to establish some boundaries between my work and life, especially at night, um, so that I can wind down and relax and get a good night's sleep. Amen to that. I think that that's probably been most people's biggest challenge is to separate their their work from their regular life and uh, and do get the rest that they need. And we all know we need our, our sleep. Uh, Kate, how about you next? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kate Kennedy, and uh, I, I'm an employee benefits consultant. Uh, I work for USI, and USI specializes in working with midsize and large employers to help them design, um, finance, deliver, and communicate benefit programs. Um, and so for myself personally, over the past year, I um, did shift to working remotely exclusively for a good portion of the past year, and then more recently have transitioned you know, back into the office. But um, I would say, I would echo what some of my colleagues have said, but um, we did talk about hydration. I do happen to have my water bottle here. Um, I'm participating in USI's um, corporate uh, weight loss challenge currently. And one of the tips that we were given was to mix, uh, I think one part orange juice with seven parts water. And, you know, using a large bottle, I'm able to track, you know, how many ounces I'm taking in throughout the day. So that has been one helpful tip. Yeah, absolutely. And it also helps to have a little flavor in the water. So it gets, you know, keeps things interesting. <laughs> right. Right. 
Um, last but not least, Toby. Hi, I'm Toby Fleischman. I'm the director of total rewards at the Metro Health System. And I would say that um, we've done a little bit of everything to keep our folks connected. Uh, we have walking challenges and we've pretty much pivoted everything that we do in the wellness space to online to connect people because we found that in addition to stress, we do have isolation and people are really struggling with that in various ways. Um, for myself, um, walking outside has been great. Um, getting a little exercise and getting outside the four walls of whatever room you happen to be in as your office of the moment has been great. Um, and also yoga, I found um, it relieves stress. And I would say that um, I agree with Matt entirely. Um, my day has bled over into my night, into my morning, into my day. So trying to keep your work during work and your home during your home time is probably the biggest challenge. Absolutely. One of my favorite pandemic related bits of parlance has been Blur's Day because all the days just took on a quality of sameness that I don't think any of us had felt before this. Um, but yes, very important to, to draw those boundaries. Um, so we're going to pivot a little bit here and because I know from, from previous webinars, our audience is insatiable in their desire to learn about metrics. So let's start with how you've seen your organizations measure the health and well-being of your workforce. Um, and you know, for those of you that are dealing with a lot of companies, what are you seeing in terms of trends? Uh, so uh, I'm gonna go back to you, Matt. We'll start there. Yeah, so um, again, I work a lot on the, on the other side of the fence with uh, health insurance companies and healthcare companies. And um, you know, the metrics that are important to them might actually be a little bit different than the metrics that are important to an employer. And in fact, because of HIPAA, there may even be a bit of a, of a wall between them. But you know, we track um, both the leading and lagging, lagging indicators of improvement of, of health, uh, health outcomes and wellness. So uh, leading indicators are often behavior change uh, related indicators around um, increased activity or, or exercise or even walking. Um, they're often um, medication compliance related. So uh, making sure people are taking their meds on, on, on time and on schedule uh, and, uh, and, and also often related to diet as well. They're eating the right foods. Um, lagging indicators are actual changes in health outcomes. So, um, you know, reductions in, 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 in hypertension, uh, better management of, of, of um, diabetes or, you know, slowing the progression of a disease or ensuring that uh, one disease state does not lead to a second or third um, related disease, like uh, someone who's pre-diabetic, making sure that they don't become uh, full-on diabetic. Someone who, has, who is diabetic, making sure they don't become insulin dependent. So, um, uh, so yeah, but metrics are, are, are critical to, to, to prove impact progress and then ultimately value to, uh, to patients and employers. Um, Kate, similar question. What trends are you seeing in terms of measurements? Well, I would say that, you know, from the employer's perspective, um, you know, like Matt said, I mean, sort of the lagging indicators would be um, for an, from an, an employer, that would be the utilization data. So looking at the actual claims spend, and we've all seen, you know, quite an anomaly that took place in 2020, in particular in the second quarter, where, you know, because of this sudden um, disruption and sort of lack of access to the, the ways that people were accessing healthcare, there was a significant drop in claim spend. Um, but fortunately, I think, you know, we did see increased awareness of and utilization of telehealth, and I'm sure we'll dig into that deeper. Um, and we've seen largely a restoration toward what would be considered more normal utilization. Um, but again, claims data is more looking in the rear view mirror, um, looking ahead, you know, Certainly, wellness and, and uh, you know preventative data assessment 
uh, to the extent that is still being collected is, is very important to understand future risks. And then um, I'm sure, you know, some of the employers on the panel could talk a little bit to, there's also sort of the qualitative data in terms of engagement surveys, pulse surveys, you know, with most many companies working remotely, it's hard to take that pulse of, you know, the organization, but I, you know, I've seen employers put in more types of survey mechanisms in order to gain that type of qualitative uh, data and metrics. Toby, are you using pulse surveys? So we are um, to a certain extent, but what we've done is we've linked our medical plan. So our claims on that side, medical and prescription drug to our wellness program. And what we do is we watch metrics of cost avoidance um, or cost um, occurrence based on wellness, pro wellness program participation. And what we try to do is see, and again, it's a lagging indicator to the points made already, you know, you're dealing with a claim that's already been incurred, but it helps with our programming as we move forward and we look at things on a rolling 12 months. So we incorporate the data that we've seen and then we continue to, I would say, morph our program on the wellness side based on the claims that we see and based on the trends that we see. Kimberly? Yeah, similar to everyone else, I think we, we really measure metrics. Uh, we have a dashboard and we measure engagement and utilization. Um, and uh, unusual for us, unlike others, is that we didn't see a dip in claims um, during the past year. We saw pretty steady utilization, which we think is good news for our population. So there won't be that spike at the end where everyone returns to going to the doctor and utilize claims. It's been consistent over the years. So what we're really looking at is our wellness participation and preventative care those kind of screenings and we've noticed spikes in um, our prescription drugs as it relates to anxiety and stress. Yeah, I'm sure that's a, a common theme across a lot yeah. of organizations. Um, Eric, would you like to add? Well, certainly our customers um, like getting lots of data. So we ingest a lot of data from uh, claims to pharmacy to wearable data to um, pulse check data within our platform, health profile data. And some of the key metrics that we track are things like monthly active users. So how many people are in the platform? What are they looking at? Uh, what wallet cards are they clicking on? Are they accessing the EAP as an example? Are they accessing telebehavioral health or uh, telemedicine visits? Are they uh, participating participating in various health journeys and programs? Are they completing those programs? Uh, how many points do they earn based on incentives that uh, the employers provide? Um, you know, so there's a lot of different metrics that we look at, but we also ask the members to tell us what their interests are, what their goals are, how they prefer to engage. Some members prefer to engage with a human. Others prefer to engage chatting, uh, you know, where there's really no voice involved. It's all uh, synchronous text back. Like, and a, like with a chatbot you're talking yeah, about? Like with a chatbot. Others mm -hmm. um, prefer to uh, have a, a virtual visit. Um, others prefer to engage in a digital program. So we do ask for member preferences, and that enables a curated approach, a personalized approach to be provided. Uh, and that's what helps drive engagement, you know, up in the 70% range that you quoted at the onset. So um, our employer clients love to see that data and they love to see the trends, what's trending up, what's trending down in terms of interest and participation and goals. And then of course, linking that to outcomes and ROI at the end. Can you, um, just a sort of supplementary question to that, I'm fascinated with the idea of people using chatbots for health-related concerns. Um, you know, telehealth people seem to have sort of embraced, uh, you know, but can you say if there's been like a, a radical shift to using the texting type of a format for questions? Yeah, it's a great question, Lydia. I don't know that it's been a radical shift, 
but we do see a steady shift uh, in that direction. And text messaging, even though you know we think of this as SMS text messaging within a platform, it's more uh, chat um, or chat bot, if you will. But um, we're seeing an increasing uh, preference to engage that way. Um, people are so used to chatting on their phone through, via text with their friends and family. And that seems to have carried over into more of a app approach or a platform approach as well. Um, we also see this a little more prevalent in the younger generations than we do in the, in the older generations. Uh, maybe people of my era are, are catching up um, to the younger generations, but they seem to have a stronger preference for chat. I think overall, uh, you know, we've, as consumers, we've become very used to a way to engage with those types of, of, you know, questions that we might have. So it seems to me that the shift is uh, maybe not radical, but it, it does make sense. You know, if you're, you know, if you're tracking a shipment, uh, you know, from a, you know, a retailer, uh, you know, and want to know where it is, then it seems equally simple to engage in a chat with, um, you know, a question that you may have about, about benefits. Uh, Toby, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, just to add to that, I think there's been a move to just-in-time care, just-in-time information. And I think the chat really fits into that. Um, we noticed with our wellness program, um, we had offered on-site fitness classes and we had had some good participation. We moved them to virtual and we moved them to recorded and the enrollment just skyrocketed because people want to be able to get to the care they need or the class they need or the support they need when they want it, which is not necessarily on a nine to five or in an office or with an appointment, so to speak. And I think that's really what the pandemic brought out for us is that people have so much going on and life is not necessarily predictable and time becomes that variable that nobody has enough of, but the more flexible you can be in the delivery of whatever it is that you're trying to deliver, the more people will grab onto that. Yeah, I think that embracing asynchronous anything has become another underlying theme of the past 12 months. Matt, did you want to? Six yeah, and, and I, it's, it's, it's fantastic and a real sign of the times that the health healthcare companies are expanding the channels through which they're engaging with, uh, with, with consumers and, and patients and um, starting to catch up with other industries that have been doing this for years. What's really important, though, is that healthcare companies take what we call an omni-channel approach to engagement, similar to what Eric was talking about, you know, it, but, it, but it, there's two dimensions here. A, you know, different consumers um, have different channel preferences. And so, um, yes, there are some that do want to do a telehealth visit, do want to do an asynchronous chat. Um, some want to pick up the phone. Um, and there's are also uh, consumers probably more often than not that probably engage on multiple channels. And it's important that healthcare companies um, are, are sharing data across channels so that um, when a consumer calls into a call center, for example, that call center agent is aware of a telehealth visit that he or she just, just experienced or is aware of a chat exchange that they had because you know, consumers want to make that call, want that call to be as efficient um, and as personalized as possible. Yeah, and if I could just hitchhike on Matt's comments, um, it's really important if there are multiple channels in this omni-channel environment that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. And I think that's the point you're making. Exactly. At. You know, if you're having a telehealth visit and then chatting with a nurse uh, and then connecting with a human being about a benefit question, that all that information is being captured uh, in a centralized place so that you're not starting over with the conversation uh, you're not losing track of a critical piece of information. And so I think that's critically important. The other thing is we have to be a little careful when we say things like chat, because chat bot is with a non-human, whereas chat is often with a human, uh, a nurse or a benefit uh, concierge specialist. Um, and when you say things like telemedicine, well, that could be uh, for acute care, 
uh, low acuity acute care. It could also be for primary care. And we're starting to see a real pickup in people actually wanting to get primary care via telemedicine. And that's slower. Uh, it's kind of the tail to the overall telemedicine trend, right. uh, which mm -hmm. really started as, you know, hey, I have something wrong and I need mm -hmm. to talk to a medical professional versus preventative preventative care. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Right. And, and, and tell a specialty too. So there's now tell companies focused on behavioral health, teledermatology. Mm -hmm. um, and so more, more and more um, you know, patients are able to even see specialists for certain right. encounters. Kate, you wanted to piggyback on that? Yeah, I, I was just going to chime in a little bit further on the idea of the omni-channel and the ways that um, individual members are engaging with platforms. And so I, I agree that the, the idea of the chat is it's a positive development overall. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, making an inquiry regarding um, something, a question about someone's actual benefits or a health condition um, is often a lot more complex than asking about, can you track my package, right? You know, if you, it's not, it's not just about, yeah, absolutely. Getting an answer, you know? <laughs> I didn't mean to simplify no, it no, quite no. that much, I, but I, you know, there's no, gonna be like the first hurdle. I, I still think it was a good analogy because it is very much about what we are, what we as consumers are experiencing with online shopping in general and looking to bring those same conveniences and um, technolo technological advances and that idea of just in time, you know, getting the answer, just what I need. But I, and I also think, especially for the younger generations, but if I would echo what, what Matt and Eric were saying is the trick I think is, a, well, two things, A, making sure people know that it is a real live human that they're connecting with and not just AI, but B, once the issue gets to that point of complexity where they would benefit from a different type of exchange and more of a dialogue, you know, being able to kind of pivot over to that and for that communication to be shared with that live person that they're going to be speaking with is that I, to me sounds like the right, there's always that balance between high tech and high touch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of this idea of meeting people where they are and giving them what they need when they need it just in time, um, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that benefits in general have changed because employers are listening. And, you know, we can talk about flexibility all day long, but what about benefits packages are changing now because employers are listening. Um, you had a thought, Kate, you're nodding. Yeah, well, you know, in my experience, I would say that benefit packages do continue to change. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the reason for the changes that we've seen are because of cost pressures. And as the cost of health benefits have increased, you know, on average eight to 10% a year, year over year over year, Unfortunately, employers have needed to make some tough decisions around adding additional complexity to the plan designs, um, which you know makes it more challenging for members to be consumers to understand how they work. But I think we're getting to that point, and, and the pandemic has helped bring to bear that we're getting to that inflection point where now we realize. You know, if we're doing, if we're running an open enrollment meeting and we realize we're, we might as well be speaking a foreign language with some of the terminology that we're using, we clearly, we need a, a different and better way. So I know that we're talking a lot about, um, you know, technological engagement with employees and members. I'm also seeing some emerging benefit plan designs that take some interesting kind of bold steps in creating a new model of instead of having your traditional, whether it be a PPO or an HMO with X type of deductible with co-pays, et cetera, you know, the concept of, of network steerage where um, there is technology in the background that is analyzing um, the member experience would be uh, where the member would go to a platform and they would basically do what looks like or feels like a Google search. They have a particular condition or a need. 
And then the technology in the background is analyzing based on their location and their, their underlying benefits, what possible providers might they steer them toward based on um, cost and you know, actual outcomes. Uh, so, and the co-pays would vary, which is what is going to incentivize people to use some providers mm -hmm. over others. So it's, it's a very interesting and I think a novel concept. Mm -hmm. you, it's almost like you're putting in like a GPS system for healthcare. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like Waze. We all use Waze and we just <laughs> plug in the address and we trust that Waze has- It's gonna get us there exactly AI. the yeah. way we need to go. <laughs> but it's also, you are seeding some level of control as well and, mm -hmm. and sort of transparency and visibility. So right. it's an interesting um, development. I, I have a question for Kimberly, but I want to pause briefly because we're at the um, half hour mark and this is where I asked Steve to come back on and do our little word from our sponsor. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Lydia. Hi, everyone. I'd like to remind anyone joining our webinar, webinar in midstream that we're from day one. We're exploring how to foster employee engagement in healthcare with technology. Our sponsor is League. As a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the top of the hour coming up. Now back to you, Lydia. Thank you. So, okay. Um, we're talking about sort of massaging the idea of, of how we're delivering what we're offering um, from an employer's perspective, Kimberly. You mentioned challenges, offering challenges, um, but what uh, overall has changed um, from before the pandemic to now in terms of your offerings? Has anything changed or is it just the delivery method? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I don't know that anything has changed specifically as much as it is the delivery and I think more robust communication on what's available. We started implementing bi-monthly communications company-wide on just a, a wide array of topics related to what benefits are available so that employees start to see benefits not only um, as something they can use when they need it because they're ill, but benefits they can use when they're well, more work-life balance related benefits, more focusing on EAP, the wellness programs, um, other tools that are available to just help with uh, daily life um, from a wellness perspective versus when to use your HSA or your PPO because you need surgery or you have cancer. Um, more preventative focused and communication based. Uh, we've really um, driven engagement through uh, multiple channels of communication, email, text, home mailers, things like that. I think that's the difference between today and before, just a lot more energy around communication to drive engagement. And are you measuring that engagement in a different way or is it just, you know, the, like email open rates or, you know, more traditional ways? Yeah, to we measure? look at um, email open rates as well as um, percentage of participation when it's on a particular benefit. We, for our wellness vendor, if we see increased enrollment after a push or home mailing to see if it was um, effective and what the impact has been. So that's how we measure it. And you just get short victories. They're not big wins, even with robust communication. It has to be uh, continuous, repeated and ongoing to see that engagement rise. Toby, did you want to add something to that? Um, I, I agree with Kimberly. Um, really, we integrated our communications between benefits, our wellness program, and retirement. And we um, instituted something similar. What we do is we have a theme where everything bolts onto the theme. So if we have wellness, for instance, we might do financial wellness. We might give credit through the wellness program. Um, to begin to break down the silos that people see between our various programs, because really wellness and health is one kind of one giant topic, if you will. It has different aspects to it. So what we're trying to do is, again, I think Kimberly has the same challenge, is keep people engaged throughout the year, as opposed to waking them up around open enrollment, having them do something, and then telling them to go back to sleep. So that, communica that constant communication, um, like Kimberly again, um, we talk about various aspects of the program, 
Um, for instance, if you have, you know, Women's Health Month, we might talk about mammograms and the benefit that you would get under the medical plan and whether or not it's free, things like that. Um, and also talk about financial wellness, you know, as a women's month, so to speak, are you putting away for retirement? Because that's also something that's going to be stress inducing if people have financial worries. And we did see that this year. Um, finances, you know, are certainly top of mind. So again, we're, we're very much focused on the integration. And what we did for the pandemic was to pivot everything that we had into an online or virtual concept that was recorded in an effort to get people to be able to access it whenever they could, because we had to really roll back on the part of our communication plan that was done in person. As a hospital, obviously we have people that could not work from home. So for them, we actually did small group meetings as much as we could, but again, you know, with a mask and six feet apart in the middle of a pandemic, um, not every frontline healthcare worker has a moment to talk about benefits, but in the times when there was opportunity, we also tried to do that. Um, I wanna push a little bit deeper into this uh, consumer omni-channel approach, because I think that there are some potential challenges with that. I mean, like retail consumers, employees are more likely to use resources that are personalized to them. Um, and so I, my question is, how do you make those offerings more personal or how are you seeing your clients and insurers making those uh, offerings more personal? And then I have a second question to piggyback onto that one, but let's, let's start there. Uh, Matt? Yeah, so personal means a few different things. I think it means um, your, um, your, your channel preferences, uh, it means your specific health conditions and needs. It means uh, your socioeconomic situation. And maybe it even means like um, your location and, and convenience. And so um, it's important that healthcare companies kind of think about personalization in a fairly holistic way across different dimensions. And so, for example, we talked about different channels before. Um, but you know, people with different healthcare conditions uh, are, are, are more likely, or healthcare needs are more likely to engage in different different ways. So, you know, if you have a, someone with a chronic condition um, that requires like daily uh, engagement with their health, you know, it's 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 sometimes hard for people to overlay uh, a new app, for example, on top of their daily behaviors. So, you know despite the best intention to the healthcare industry of offering these tools and services um, to, to make managing these conditions easier, you know, behavior change is really hard. Um, we, uh, we humans hate change. <laughs> yes, and especially, <laughs> and, and especially layering that on top of like a, a new channel too. So behavior change through a digital channel, if you're not already engaging in other aspects of your life through digital can be really challenging. Um, in terms of, of, of cost, um, you know, making sure that uh, in socioeconomic uh, situate, uh, um, circumstances, making sure that how we're engaging with patients and, and consumers um, takes that into account. So like not everyone has a smartphone, um, you know, not everyone has um, access to um, exercise equipment or access to uh, you know, healthy foods, for example. Um, and it's important that uh, employers and healthcare companies are providing options and, um, and access to some of these things that, that um, certain segments of the population don't have. And then, you know, convenience or location and ensuring that like when a patient, someone is looking for a, a, new, a, a new doctor or a physical therapy um, that a healthcare company isn't recommending one, that's on the other side of town because the more inconvenient healthcare is, the less likely a consumer is to engage with it. Um, Eric, do you wanna add something to that? Talk about personalization. Well, it's, it's hard to, to follow um, Matt's 
comments because I certainly agree that all of those things are critical uh, with respect to personalization. Mm -hmm. um, maybe two points to add. One would be it's certainly based on data. So in order to do all those things that Matt talked about, you have to know something about the person. Uh, you have to know where they live as an example, if you're going to try to find them a convenient healthcare provider in their area. Uh, you need to know if they live in a food desert, if, if they are having issues relative to uh, social determinants of health. You may also need to know some of the community resources that are available to those individuals that may not be part of the benefit plan, um, but they're part of the community. Um, that could be a food pantry as an example. It could be um, uh, a walk-in clinic. It could be a, uh, a health department, a free clinic. Where's the best place to get a vaccine? Um, what's available in my area? Where are we at in the, you know, there's lots of information out there about vaccines and uh, people can go to multiple places, but they may have questions and concerns. Uh, are the people that are servicing the benefit plan up to speed on, uh, you know, where to direct people to options relative to vaccines? So data is critical. Um, the second point I would underscore is we talked a little bit about uh, the consumer. I think there's a point that we could say can consumer grade. So we talked about online shopping before. I think people are looking more and more for a consumer grade experience. And what do I mean by that? An experience that you might get uh, by shopping online or by having a, a really good retail experience as opposed to the kind of experience where you call the phone company and you're on hold for 35 minutes and you go through multiple voice, you know, prompts and press two for dental and three for vision. And, you know, then you get frustrated and you hang up after 30 minutes because no one answered the phone or they transferred you once they did. That's not a very consumer grade experience versus how kind of online retail, online shopping has become much more consumer grade. And this is oftentimes denoted by net promoter scores where the consumer grade experiences are having 70, 80, even 90% or, or 90 uh, net promoter scores. Whereas those, you know, cable TV companies, not to knock that is the, is the punching bag or the old fashioned phone company kind of service might have a single digit uh, consumer grade experience. So I think people want personalization based on data but they also want a consumer great experience. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, the, the best retailers have figured it out. Um, and again, going back to this analogy, because I think that, you know, Omnichannel sort of started with, uh, you know, retailers selling brick and mortar and, and online. Um, and the data that they use offers that customer a very personal experience when you have a rotating cast of sales associates in a store that may or may not remember you when you walk in the door like they did, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, and I'm saying a hundred as, you know, a euphemism because I'm one of the old people who remembers when that used to happen. Um, but, you know, with this personalization, I'm, I'm trying to kind of tease out what best practices are. How do you uh, figure out um, in particular, where it goes beyond the benefit package, how do you figure out how to personalize those offerings to get the employees to engage with the offerings? Um, so I'm looking at all your faces and I'm just wondering who I'm going to go. <laughs> Does anyone want to raise their hand for that one? Toby? I'll take the bullet. Um, one of the things that we do, and again, I think it's it's a multi-pronged approach. If anyone has a silver bullet, I'm really interested in hearing it, but I haven't found it yet. Um, we have a social determinants of health survey. We incent it through the wellness program for people to complete it. And then the, that data is sent off to community partners that we have engaged with as a health system to provide support. So really what I think the most important thing in, in my world right now is to make sure that we close the loop so that all the data that everybody sees, that everybody gets, can be seen by everyone. Um, our wellness platform, same thing. 
It should be reactive to the information you put in. It should be reactive and send you back what it is that you need. And it's a constant dialogue, even with a system. But I would say that some of the best um, inputs that we have are human. So we have employee, but, um, employee resource groups that also provide us information. And that's really the voice of the employee in the moment. Um, we have providers. And again, as a health system, we, we benefit from that. We have providers that also from a business or provider perspective will tell us what they find to be either a bump in the road in our benefits or something that people just can't seem to navigate. So we are kind of a, an omni-channel as you described it, getting data inputs from all over so that, and different types as well, so that we can basically formulate the benefit plans to be a more integrated singular experience so that when someone says, I have a medical problem, it's not medical. It could be something the EAP needs to address. It could be something that, to the point that Eric made, it could be that they're in the middle of a food desert and can't find anything to eat. So we try to integrate all of those inputs so that the benefit becomes a little more rich in its delivery. I'm fascinated by the fact that you brought up ERGs because usually when we talk about ERGs, it's more in terms of uh, increasing that sense of inclusiveness in an organization and you know that sense of belonging people who are like you all talking together um so uh, just to sidestep a moment here um can like how do you use that information um kimberly do you have experience with this where the ergs like people talking to each other about benefits and resources we currently don't have employee resource groups. I think that's something TBD in the future state um, as we grow in our DNI initiatives. So that that's a challenge for us. I think that's an interesting point that Toby raised in terms of gaining information. So for us, I think that source right now would be through employee survey data and feedback. But I think ERGs are an interesting way to obtain feedback based on the, those particular groups and what they think they need the best. So that's an interesting perspective. Go ahead, Toby. Um, it's interesting that you, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I did not think that we would get the type of great feedback that it would be available to us. But at, for instance, we have um, um, employee resource groups in every flavor of type of person you can imagine. Um, and we've gotten feedback on our communications, on our open enrollment communications. For instance, for the LBGTQ plus community, we have to be mindful of pronouns. We have to be mindful in our communications when we talk about people like me exhibits where we try to give an example of someone that might be in a situation similar to the reader that we'd be very careful to be inclusive so that family situations, family units are described in a way that people can find themselves in the communication. And we take feedback on our communications from all over to make sure that we are, we're expressing ourselves in a way that actually speaks to our population. Hey, you wanna add? Yeah, I was just going to add very briefly that um, the way that you're talking about these ERGs, Toby, it's almost as if they're standing focus groups. You know, we, we've all, you know, we understand the concept of a focus group and, but the fact that they're already in place and that they're already trusted venues for people to actually express their feedback, that sounds like a, a great mechanism. Go ahead, Kimberly, you wanted to add? I, I just wanted to say, Toby, to your point about inclusiveness, I, you know, it just raised an issue that I'm thinking about, even in our photos that we use in our communications, even though there, there's diversity, uh, you know, I don't know that we think about diversity in terms of same-sex couples that we show with adoption and things like that. So that that's a very interesting point and a different perspective you get from um, resource groups. So that's a good point. Go ahead, Toby. Yeah, I, I honestly, I, I was surprised. Um, one of the things that we've always tried to do is make sure that our our photos aren't inclusive. It, it's so funny that you bring that up, Kimberly, because I think that's the first time that people say, hey, I don't, I don't see myself in anything. So um, 
we we often we often don't use people because sometimes you you end up inadvertently um, not really covering all possible types of individuals. So we use different themes in our benefits communications that link people together in a different way. So for instance, last year, we did a, um, a history timeline of our organization from 18, oh, I should know this, 1865, I think, a good 185 years ago, through all of the buildings that have been constructed in our system so that everybody could feel and see, oh, that's where I work because we're in many satellite locations. It's not just main campus. Um, and that was kind of a unifying effect that we felt would work perhaps better than trying to make sure that we had every single possible type of employee um, shown because you're sure to miss someone inadvertently and people really try to make sure that what they're reading speaks to them as we go back to that personalization. Yeah, I was gonna say that's the ultimate personalization. I mean, if you don't see yourself in something you can't really feel good about engaging with it. Um, Kate, did you wanna speak well, to that? Well, I, I have a related topic but maybe it's, it's taking us in a slightly different direction and that is from the employer standpoint, um, and I know that you know Kimberly and Toby, you guys are sharing some really great examples and great work that you're doing. Um, I'm thinking from the vendor standpoint. Um, you know, right now, I think in some ways the pandemic has raised, as we've said, so much more awareness of health and, and well-being, and I think it's given um, employers the sense of there's there's an opportunity and almost like a permission for to introduce new technologies where their employees and members are, are ready for it now. And there's a ton of innovation that's going on right now in, in the vendor space. But I think one of the biggest challenges that employers have um, as they evaluate all of these, I mean, there's an explosion of new point solutions, um, is where to invest their dollars. And do they, one of the biggest dilemmas I think that employers have is, do they set aside this separate budget to put in a benefits aggregator that might you know, unify all of the benefit programs and serve up general information to employees in more of a just-in-time basis to benefit all? Or knowing that five to 10% of their members are the ones who are really driving their claims costs who have chronic conditions that are either untreated or you know, do they invest in a more targeted approach to build trust with, with that population and to bring you know, individualized solutions to that group? That to me is one of the biggest dilemmas from an employer standpoint is how do you spread that peanut butter, that limited amount that you have? Well, and that's, a, that's an excellent point too, especially in terms of personalization because then you have to figure out like which, as you were saying, which of those populations do you wanna serve? What are the best practices for investing and getting the most engagement ROI for that investment? So does anyone have any thoughts on that? Eric? Well, um, those are excellent points. We really focus on the entire population because uh, this year's high claimants uh, will be different than next year's high claimants and the year after that. And so uh, you do need to have a special focus on uh, some of your high cost um, healthcare uh, folks, but at the same time, um, what about those moderate or rising risk populations? And even for the seemingly well populations that could be um, not displaying symptoms or claims that might indicate that two or three years down the road, uh, they could be high cost, but they could be. Um, and so, yes, spreading the peanut butter uh, is sometimes hard to do when you're trying to have something for everyone. But at the same time, uh, that gets back to personalization, right? To try to really tailor and curate a set of resources for every individual, uh, regardless of where they're at in terms of the risk profile, where they're at in terms of their demographics. Uh, so that's one comment. Um, and, uh, and then 
to earlier comments, engaging them in the way that they prefer to be engaged. Um, this this begs the privacy question now because you know we talk about um, when we talk about engagement and personalization. The flip side of that is, you know, how how much information is too much information? How do you get um, that employee trust to give you the data that you need in order to make offerings more personal, um, but while still maintaining privacy? I do not have an answer for this. So this is why um, I have my experts here. So um, who, who would like to take a stab at the privacy question first, Toby? Um, so this, this takes time. Um, what we've done is when we talk about wellness and we talk about engagement on a wellness platform, um, that's really where we need to make sure that people understand that what they put into that system voluntarily doesn't come back to the employer. And we've, we've stated it as outright as that. As a hospital system, we don't need to worry so much about information you give to your provider. Um, everyone is well-trained in HIPAA. Everyone understands the, you know, the importance of that. Um, so we don't really have to deal with that. But on the wellness side, we have actually gone out to the two participants and said, if you share this information with us, we can help you and we will not share it with, with the Metro Health System as your employer because not everybody has shared with their boss the fact that they have high blood pressure or the fact that they're going to need a kidney transplant. Um, but it does, I, I think that's where the personal touch where you really still have a human to human conversation about what's going to happen and how the data that you give to us is going to be treated. Yeah, and not only how it's just a piggyback on your point, Toby, not only is it how the data is going to be treated from a privacy perspective, but also how the data will be used to help you as a consumer. And so when asking for the data, um, being clear, like, like what the rationale or the reason that we're asking for it, and then down the road, like really showing how you've used the data. So if it's about, we, we've talked about social determinants of health a bit. Um, if it's about your access to, um, to healthy foods, for example, if you're, if you're asking questions about access to healthy food and someone shares it like they don't have access to healthy, healthy food, I would hope and expect that, that the healthcare company in return would provide them with options for accessing more healthy food, for example. Kate, did you have something to add to that or? Well, the only other thing I would add to that is um, I, I, you know, I agree with what Toby was saying that it is, it's an ongoing sort of dialogue, if you will, between an employer and employee and sort of building that trust and certainly being very clear in the communications in terms of how data is being used and that it's really, you know, only being shared with back with the employer in an aggregate depersonalized basis is critical. I think another element that you know, I have seen in some organizations, it doesn't always happen, it's difficult to do, is if the trust is really there, especially for employers that are self-insured, you know, there's not just a how will sharing my data help me, but how will sharing my data and my engagement benefit the collective and all, keep all of us you know, healthy and keep our health costs down so that we can continue to receive such rich benefits. Um, that's like the next level, more evolved state. It's, it's very challenging to get to, but it's something certainly that employers can aspire to. Really? Yeah, I, I agree with Kate. And I would just reiterate that it still boils down to communication in order to build that trust, to get that information. And then for employees to see that the evolution of programs based on that feedback and those results in a confidential manner so that they see new, new programs that benefit them based on their participation. I think that's really important. So not just getting the data, but see the action that follows over time based on their participation. Well, we are just about at the top of the hour and we're getting a lot of questions from the audience as I anticipated. Um, so we're just gonna take a, a brief break, bring, bring Steve back on for 
Another word? Thank you. And thanks to all of you who are participating in our webinar on fostering employee engagement in healthcare with technology. And thanks again to our sponsor, League. Uh, once again, in case you missed it at the top of the hour, I'm going to share something special we have for attendees of today's webinar. Our next monthly virtual conference happens to be tomorrow, April 21st, and it's about digital tools for building an engaged, productive team. Thanks to today's sponsor, we're offering a complimentary VIP ticket to everyone joining today's webinar. These are normally $149, so you'll want to grab one while you can. I've placed the link in the chat space again. With that out of the way, at this time, we'll be taking questions from the audience, and there's quite a few. Back to you, Lydia. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is a lively discussion. I'm thrilled. Um, thank you all for your participation so far. Um, we have one that I was anticipating, um, and they're asking, uh, ask the speaker, is if they've tried ways to convey healthcare options in a less bewilderingly complex way, and are employees sometimes given too many options? Um, I'm sure this is going to draw a chuckle from all of you, Kate. Well, what do you say? Well, I think this definitely gets back to what I was saying before that sometimes, you know, if you need a separate slide in your enrollment presentation just to explain what the acronyms are, that's not a good start, you know. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I am seeing, you know, some innovation in terms of plan design to try to just kind of whiteboard and start afresh um, to uh, simplify uh, benefits design. But I'm also seeing a greater usage of multimedia. Um, you know, we uh, regularly embed videos into our communications that might be just short snippets, almost like, you know, think of when we all hop out to YouTube to just try to better understand something. So I am seeing uh, ways that we can embed multimedia into communication so that we can help people out along the way to better understand the concepts and, and, uh, and just make things a bit simpler. Anyone else wanna chime in with some less bewilderingly complex ways to communicate benefits, Toby? Uh, I'm just chuckling because I think it's the constant challenge that we have is trying to simplify something that is actually very complex. But one thing that we do with our communications is that we, we give it to folks to read before we publish. And we pick someone that has nothing to do with benefits, no ringers in the audience, to see what they get out of it. And we don't tell them anything. We just give it to them and we say, and we then ask them questions about what they've read to see if they can actually understand the text as we have. And it's a great source of information because some of the concepts that, um, <laughs> to Kate's point, that you need that slide for to actually describe that we know because we live the loony life that we do, folks don't necessarily get, but they're, they will tell you if you, want, if you wanted to bring across a particular message, what words would have actually done that. So that's a good source of information for us. Yeah, I really appreciate what Toby said. And um, there's quite a bit of research in behavioral economics on things like choice overload. And uh, if you give people a choice of, you know, 25 flavors of jelly, they take none. Uh, if you give them the choice of like chocolate, strawberry, vanilla ice cream, you know, they can narrow that down. Um, and so uh, I think we do have to be mindful of too many choices. Uh, we certainly need to be mindful of jargon. There's no shortage of jargon in our industry. So plain English, I love the idea of videos. Uh, people can resonate real, real easily with short, engaging videos. Uh, decision support tools uh, that ask people some basic questions, help guide them through the process. Um, a lot of the, the modern technology and, and benefit platforms now have uh, various kinds of decision support tools built in so that even though the choices may seem complex and overwhelming, if they're couched in a conversational manner, uh, helping people make decisions, uh, that goes a long way. Um, the, the fact of the matter is healthcare is complex, benefits are complex. And so um, using the technology that's available to us to try to simplify that and to make it uh, more clear uh, certainly is a step in the right direction. 
Um, we have someone in the audience asking about new expanded health benefits. Are they speaking up about what they want? What are you hearing about? Um, this was a question I, I personally had. Um, and they're asking uh, fertility benefits, for example, or new mental health choices. So what are the trends in terms of new benefits that you're hearing employees really want? Someone raise their hand or I will call. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the mental health one and let someone else take maybe others. Yeah, you can go next, Kimberly. <laughs> so on mental health, um, it used to be you go to your network directory, you find a therapist or a counselor in the network, you, you call them up, you get an appointment, you wait 25 weeks to get in. <laughs> um, and so now people are really looking for multiple ways to engage on mental health, certainly telebehavioral health, digital health programs that include things like meditation, stress management, tips for living. Uh, so digital interactions, some of that is based on chatting with coaches and therapists, um, either synchronously or asynchronously. Um, people are looking for uh, multiple ways to engage on the mental health front and not have to wait you know, to get into an appointment. Uh, and to have things to do in between appointments as well. And we've seen the ramp up in terms of utilization in mental health resources, uh, pandemic related, um, off the charts really in the last uh, 12 months. Kimberly, you, have, you were quick on the button as well. Yeah, I, I was gonna say it's more of an expanded benefit, but for us, it's really PTO, right? This whole year, everyone has been uh, virtual and not able to travel. So the feedback from our employee base is what other sort of flexibility can we have with PTO utilization? So we're looking at programs to engage employees with PTO payout, PTO banks, um, charity donations through PTO. So expanded opportunities to really leverage and utilize PTO because we see our, our liability just building up because employees can't take it and frustration from employees because they're reaching caps and can't go anywhere. So one of our challenges right now is we're working on programs to add that flexibility to look at payout options and transfer options and charity options utilizing the PTO bank. Fascinating. Kate, did you want to add something? Well, I was just going to add that, you know, from uh, from my role, I work with companies of many sizes and across all industries. And so this notion of, you know, adding additional and new benefit offerings, it definitely, you know, there is a trend, but it's very industry dependent, I would say. Um, it's also dependent on employer size. So generally speaking, it, it, it would appear that the larger the employer, the more sort of in-house resources they may have to manage these programs. And also based on industry, it's where there is the greatest sort of war for talent. That's where there seems to be more and more pressure for these employers to offer differentiated benefits. So I'm seeing in biotech and high tech, I mean, those would be the more typical industries. Um, I'll just mention briefly, we, uh, USI, we sponsor the largest um, survey of uh, benefits benchmarking for middle market companies. Last year, I think we had 6,000 companies participate so that gives us a really great sort of viewpoint in being able to understand these types of trends. And uh, it's, I would just mention that this is a mechanism that really any and all groups would be um, able to participate in to, to get some sense of how their programs are stacking up. Matt, did you wanna add something about trends? No, I think my colleagues answered that question perfectly. Thank you. Great. Um, so, Here's an interesting one. Are there ways you try to convey relevant health news to employees or do you leave it to the media? Example, a new study says if you don't get enough sleep, you might suffer dementia earlier. That's just, that, that may not be a real example, but um, just toggling between the, the responsibility of the employer versus letting people find out on their own. Um, who's, who's like to take that one? No one's game, Eric? Well, we certainly have um, any content that we put out mm -hmm. developed by clinicians, reviewed by 
uh, medical experts, if it's going to be content that we're going to make available to our members and our customers, uh, employees, then we can't just grab it off the internet. <laughs> uh, we have to make sure that it's reviewed by, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a leading healthcare expert uh, for for medical efficacy, certainly, mm -hmm. um, but also usability and readability and understandability to the earlier point about confusion. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, combating just the, the blur of information that's out there. Talk about choice overload, um, plenty of information and misinformation mm -hmm. out there. Uh, and so we try to very carefully manage uh, what goes out. Toby? Um, so we take a very similar approach to, to Eric's point. Um, there really is information overload and um, I think people are a little more suspect um, in terms of the information they're getting from channel from channels they're not familiar with. Um, so what we do as a health system is that if it's a health related issue, um, we will definitely have our in-house experts opine on it. And then in our on our intranet, we have a revolving um, window of articles, really very timely. Um, so we have folks that are out there reading and then not um, I guess pre-digesting, if you will, a little bit, simplifying, and then bringing home the, the, the relevant points for our folks. And we put that out on a regular basis. I know that there's been a lot of misinformation around the vaccine. And while that doesn't necessarily fall under the you know health benefits umbrella, I know that a lot of employers and employees are wondering about where the best information they can get. And it also goes back to, you know, um, what we were talking about earlier about community resources and what's the employer's role in helping the employee get a vaccine or find the, the right information about it. Kate, did you wanna? Well, I would just say that, you know, for the groups that, that I've been working with through the pandemic, you know, the role of the benefits manager or the head of HR, you know, it's been incredible the, the additional hats that that person or those people have needed to wear. And they are being looked to within their organizations as the source of um, a lot of you know, content and direction um, in terms of health information around, um, at first it was more around testing and now around the vaccines. Um, I would say generally speaking, um, you know, I believe that individuals in those roles are looking to their departments of health because you know the vaccine rollout is so dependent on each state um, and you know I've seen some states do a better job than other in providing resources to employers to help educate their employees um, certainly you know their their benefit consultants can play a role as well with providing vetted um, and more simplified communications to help you know communicate why getting a vaccine is important. Um, but, you know, it, this does, it begs a whole other question around what sort of stance an employer may take. Certainly they can encourage their employees to get a vaccine, but there are different ways of doing that, different ways of incenting, different ways of, you know, asking your employees to self-report whether they've had the vaccine. Um, are you going to require people to report that they've had the vaccine before they return to their office, for example? So there's a whole host of questions that you know people in these roles probably never thought they would have to grapple with. It's quite a challenging time. I often say that um, HR leaders are sort of the unsung heroes of the pandemic because they've had to wear exactly as you said so many hats and never would have imagined themselves to be in this role juggling so many things. Um, but you know, that, that leads into another question, which is, what do you see as the employer's responsibility to engage workers around health and well-being? I mean, there's a business case to be made here, I know, um, but I'd, I'd like to get all of your take on, on this juggling of responsibility. What's the employer's responsibility? What's the individual's responsibility? How do those two things work together? Matt? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think, given what's been discussed on this panel, just and, and that we all experience around just the 
the complexity and the, what was the word that was used? The be be bewildering? No, uh, beleaguering, whatever the word was. Be bewilderingly. <laughs> bewilderingly, yes, uh, which I fully agree with. Um, nature of our industry, um, I think employers have a, have a, have a huge responsibility to, uh, um, to help their employees um, better navigate the resources that are available to them. And, and quite frankly, the resources that they're paying for, you know? And, um, and so, um, you know, the, the, I know the, the healthcare industry is trying um, to make things more simplified and, 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 and easier to work with. Um, but I do think in the meantime, an employer needs to play an important transi translation layer in between the healthcare system and the employees. Someone else, responsibility of the employer, Kate? Well, I would just add that, you know, the American healthcare system relies very heavily on employers as purchasers, you know, behind Medicare and Medicaid, you know, commercial purchasers are the, the third largest, you know, responsible parties. Um, and, you know, you mentioned it does make good business sense to um, keep people healthy and engaged. We, we know it's intuitive and it's also been proven that, you know, those that are healthier and engaged, you know, drive more productivity, performance, retention, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I think it's also because of the role that healthcare plays for an American employer, it's a critical part of the company's employee value proposition as well. And it does give an employer some opportunity to distinguish themselves uh, versus other employers in the offerings that they're providing and the support that they're providing to uh, their employees. Um, you know, and I think it's, you could argue that the same way that you know, if you keep your employees happy, you know they're going to deliver better service and create happier customers. Of an essential component to keeping an employee happy is to keep them healthy. Absolutely. Kimberly, you had a thought? No, I agree with Kate. I think it's a partnership though, right? So there's a employer responsibility, but there's also an individual responsibility. And I think you target that through incentives, program design, and just communications, and specifically programs to target those areas where you need to see market improvement and communicate how that drive outcomes, cost, and further program development. So I think it's the employer and the employee working together to build that trust and that relationship. Okay. Um, I'd like to piggyback on what Kimberly said. I, I couldn't have said it better. What I would add to that is that um, I think that healthcare is one of the largest items that people use that they don't actually buy. And I think that it's important that people understand that what they do affects the employer and what the employer is buying so that they can see, and again, to Kimberly's point, they can that they're, they're a required and a valued partner in controlling a huge cost in an organization. And it affects the organization, not just you know, in benefits in terms of who shows up to work and who doesn't, or who shows up but doesn't really show up, right? Um, but that from a financial perspective, things like raises and bonuses could be very much affected by money spent on a medical plan if people don't really engage and take care of themselves. It's not for the employer to save the employee, I suppose, is the way I would look at it. Okay. I was just going to add, you know, with, with Kimberly, what you said, I think it's exactly right that it is a partnership and that, you know, incentives play a big role in that, you know, what I've seen in my experience, not just working in consulting, but I also, you know, spent uh, five years working for a large wellness company. The trick seems to be often it's placing those those external incentives that are going to be meaningful enough to sort of entice the employee to get them to initially engage, but to give them enough of a positive experience that they can then learn themselves, oh, there's an intrinsic benefit. Because intuitively, we should all want to be healthier, right? But we have challenges and behavior change is hard. We've talked about that. But it's, you know, that's 
um, I think just one way to think of it is, you know, those incentives that employers use often would be, you know, points, et cetera, things we think of in a wellness program, but it's just getting them and meeting them where they are and getting them to sort of, you know, taste, taste this new drink and then they taste it and they say, oh, well, of course, you know, and, and then they, that's when real change happens. Absolutely. Um, Kevin has been a very engaged member of our audience and um, has another question for you. Uh, the assumption here is that each employer has access to the data. If they are a smaller employer, they often won't have access to utilization data unless they're in a level funded self-insured model. How should those employers act? Who would like to take this one? I'm, so just to clarify the question, so how should the employers who are not getting their data act? Right. Yeah. If they're in a level funded or self-insured model, how do they, how do they? Well, yeah. So I, you know, if small employers in general would be more likely to be in a fully insured model and depending on the state regulation, if they're not large enough, they would not, or the um, healthcare insurer policy, they may not get their claims data. One trend that we're seeing is that um, there are more level funded and self-insured products that are becoming available to smaller employers, which I see as an overall positive because then it does allow a company that may have maybe only 100 employees or lower to get their claims data and also to share in the rewards if their claims perform favorably. Um, for those companies that aren't there, that are in fully insured arrangements, um, you know, it is challenging, especially if they're in most states lower than 100 enrolled, they don't get their claims data. So you're sort of in this black box um, kind of model. Um, but it is, you know, in, we do know that health rates, you know, that premium rates are driven very much still based right. on experience. So you're still, you don't give up just because you, you're not seeing your exact, you know, claims data. But I, I admit it is a much more challenging uh, approach. Anyone else want to add? No. I we'll just go. wanted wanted to say that Kate, right? You don't get the claims data, but you do get some general trends, even in a small, fully insured plan. That can help guide you through program development, communication maybe even um, surveys to your small employee base. You don't get the detail that you get under a self-insured program, but you'll get a general high-level overview that you can use. Absolutely, you general utilization, yep. Um, hope that answers your question, Kevin. He's been very engaged. Um, so uh, next one is about AI. And we started talking about that right at the beginning. AI has been integrated into many healthcare applications. How do companies take stock of bias within these technologies when evaluating new or existing technologies? Eric? Well, first of all, it's an excellent question because there is bias built into AI. Um, some might say there's a lot of artificial in artificial intelligence as well. Um, so I think uh, people who develop algorithms have a corporate responsibility as well. And that is to, and there was a whole section on this in the um, International Foundation of Employee Benefits uh, fellow exam, which those in the audience who have their CEBS designation may know. It's just about the responsibility of technology, uh, people who develop algorithms as an example, to do so in an ethical way. Um, and, and so I think it's okay for an employer to ask questions of what's behind some of this technology. You know, how do you um, help people make decisions? What kinds of uh, questions are asked? And, and what do the answers to those questions lead people to? Um, so I think good due diligence uh, now needs to include a heightened awareness of, of AI and other technology to make sure that it is in fact um, the highest degree of ethical standards. Ethical and, and equitable. And I think that one, uh, Matt, I'm gonna to come to you next, but I just did, wanted to 
point out that I think you can find out a lot by asking the question about what the data set that they're using to create the algorithm is like and how inclusive and equitable that is. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, I fully agree with what, what you just said, Lydia, and also what, what Eric's point. And, um, you know, I think companies need to be thoughtful about, um, about, about where they're applying AI to what, what, what circumstances, use cases, um, and also, um, you know, how they scale AI, you know, if and when it, once it's proven. So for example, um, you know, I think at least to start on, on a, new, on a u, new use case, it's always important to start with a pilot group. And, you know, you train the AI models um, to, to, to make sure to, to work through some of the bias that, that you're um, referring to, it's in the question. And, you know, pilot participants know that they're in a pilot and then there's also some human intervention on top of the pilot so that there's a there's a, a bit of um you know testing and learning period um around the ai and you know secondly it just sort of just depends on the use case too but like you know in in in, in high risk you know high acute settings for example for high risk patients um and companies need to be very um dis discriminating around how if and how they use ai because the stakes are so high so um you know these are these are you know very challenging questions as we grapple with the sort of side effects of technology advancement well in the last few minutes that we have I'd like to do a speed round uh, <laughs> so my question to all of you is, we, we've heard ad nauseum about Zoom fatigue, but in this particular webinar, we're talking about engagement and communication. How much communication should you be having with, with employees, with your employers to keep people engaged, but not have them be fatigued? I'm gonna go around the room. So Eric, I'm starting with you, but everybody should be ready to answer this question. Speed round. Uh, if it's personalized, tailored and curated, it can be more frequent than if it's prepackaged and standard. And so you can have uh, multiple times a week communication if it's personalized. Kimberly? Uh, I, I agree with Eric. I think personalization is the key to determine frequency and what the topic is. So I think the more personal you can get, the more frequent you can communicate, and then you're not burdening the employee population with a bunch of communications that don't resonate with them. Yeah, yeah I think also offering flexibility to and uh, allowing people to engage on their time when it's convenient or, um, you know, uh, not even convenient, but it's most conducive to their her holistic life needs, including childcare, parental caregiving, um, personal wellness, et cetera. And so offering different options and flexibility around that, I think will help keep people engaged. Okay. I would just add that, you know, there's the notion of sort of the push and the pull so we've talked about the push in terms of, you know, if, if the communications are more personalized, you have more permission to communicate out and push messages more frequently. I agree with that. And then I think there's, you know, ideally employers have a platform that employees see of value that they know is there, that will be there for that when they find themselves in those just in time moments, when they're ready to go seek out the information and hopefully it's readily accessible to them. And Toby, balance between frequency and fatigue. So I have to say, I agree with everyone who came before me. Um, it depends on whether you're pushing or someone's pulling. Um, I think push definitely has to be personalized so that it eventually leads to the pull off a platform when someone can bring down the information as they need it. And asynchronous as well. All right, well, we're just about ready to wrap. So I'm gonna thank everyone, Eric, Kimberly, Matt, Kate, Toby, you've been terrific. This has been a great conversation. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Lydia, and our wonderful speakers, Kate, Kimberly, Toby, Matthew, and Eric. It's worth 
mention you all once again, you were the opposite of bewildering. You were crisp and clear on a really vital topic. So thanks again to our sponsor League and to all of you for participating today. If you'd like to join us for more virtual events, you can head to our website fromday1.co and check out more of our upcoming webinars and conferences. I'll mention a couple. On Tuesday, April 27th, we'll be exploring how to help your employees navigate the fertility journey. On Thursday, April 29th, we'll talk about disaster readiness, relief, and in recovery. So thank you all very much. Stay well.